uh, Ty Shea. I'm here for San Francisco. It's my wife's birthday today, so I'm going to try to get back to San Francisco today. Um, I lead marketing for the LifeLock and Norton Brands. We're part of a company called Symantec. I'm Stephen Freitas. I am the Chief Marketing Officer at the Outdoor Advertising Association, uh, representing the out-of-home industry uh, in the U.S. I'm Aditi Javeri Gokhale. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Northwestern Mutual. Uh, we're a financial planning company, been around for about 160 years. Hi, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at GE for our innovation and growth businesses, which, in, which includes GE Ventures, our corporate venture capital arm. Um, so I'm going to start with a broad question, and then we'll get a little more uh, into the weeds. But I'd love for everyone here to um, just uh, give us your, your thoughts on what the biggest change is for the role of the CMO. Um, you know, in the last two years, what's what's been the biggest change? Let's let's start on this end with Dara. So I think the biggest thing is this role of the CMO has evolved so much. And how do you bring storytelling, experience, culture, and analytics and data? Right? How do you bring all of these things together to create value, drive growth, and strengthen the relationship with the customer? And what's driving that? And I think what's driving that is a couple of things. One, I think the technology innovation and advancement, right? I think about what the MarTech stack used to look like a decade ago. <laughs> what it was looks like. Was stack? there a MarTech? Exactly. And like what it looks like today, right? Um, and so I think technology and innovation and advancement in that space has really driven a lot of that. I think just people's understanding of data. Right? The, you know, I think we kind of were like, what is data? Data swamp. And now it's like, how do we use data to drive insights? Um, so kind of the evolution of our understanding of data and how we can use data in a market-backed approach to make decisions um, has been really critical. And I think the third thing is just we're in the age of the conscious consumer, right? Where brand reflects culture and culture reflects brand and experience is huge in terms of how customers perceive and receive your brand. I want to come back to that later. I think uh, from my vantage point, the evolution of a CMO is sort of the breadth of the role that the CMO has taken now and in the future. So if you think about it, we're the first point of contact with the customer. We're the ones who actually understand the customer, its pain points, its barriers, the insights. Um, and we're able to also influence uh, large organizations at the C-suite level in terms of understanding things and building experiences from a consumer perspective. So I think gone are the days of CMOs which you know were entirely responsible for building brand awareness and brand advertising. It's all about the end-to-end -end customer experience now, and there's a large amount of influence we have based on that with the company strategy. So I think that's a big change to when I was a CMO maybe you know, five or eight years ago. Yeah, you know, uh, Forrester calls the role of CMO today um, strategic um, activism or activists, you know, and it kind of gets to both points, you know, but particularly what you're saying, and, and I, I think that the role of the CMO today in most organizations is really to be that voice of the customer within the organization so that you're, um, you're going across uh, departments and groups and, and, and business units really advocating, as you say, um, on behalf of the customer at all levels and all touch points. And then the other, the other thing, and, and the way I think it's really changed uh, the role of the marketing, uh, the CMO has changed, um, is through that sort of merger and understanding of uh, MarTech and AdTech both, and, and that kind of merger of both of those together and how you, you do that. Right, it, and after you know, uh, Ty responds, I want to talk a little bit about the new skills that, yeah. that you, you've had to adopt. Um, yeah, I think it's um, every, you know, more, now more and more brands want to go direct. So the biggest change to me is first party data uh, for um, corporations are, are owning the data and actually owning the customers. And so I think with that uh, creates a, a ripple effect of, of consequences, but most of it's about accountability. You know, within my company, there's an email that goes around every two hours about how many customers we got in the last two hours. So that kind of accountability, I think, is changing the CMO's job and also changing the whole infrastructure of, uh, of, of what they do. This is perfect because you each touched on something different that I really, that we can dive deep deep into. But first, um, what you know, I want to come back to you, Stephen. Like, the, you know, when we're talking about MarTech and AdTech and these, you know, whatever tech, you know, you, you now need to uh, be able to, 
analyze data and you know find insert ads to your customers well, like how, like what does that mean for the kinds of skills that you need to learn and how are you learning them yeah you know it's it's all about understanding the value of specific data sets i think you know we, we can we can have so many data stacks now going up and up and up and and you get to a point where you have to, to really sort of dissect and understand which data is important for what you're trying to do and which isn't. And it's not always the same. You know, you have to look at each problem that you're trying to solve and you have to understand which, which pieces of data are best going to solve my problem. And so it's really, um, I think, becoming a data analytics job more than anything else yeah. in, in some ways. How are you learning these skills? I'm sure, Aditi, you have you, you're dealing the you know the, the same world. You know, you need to understand data. Like, how are you learning these these new skills? How to use these new technologies? Yeah, I think I think before we go there, I think what what we've done within the organization is what are the objectives we're trying to drive. You start there, right, and then you work your way backwards in terms of what what are the data, what are the metrics, what are the KPIs that you want to sort of identify, set allow a common definition within the organization uh, to drive those objectives. So, so that's the first thing. And then I think, as you said, Stephen, you know, data in itself, um, there are all sources of data. You and I have talked about this. It's really, I think, the success comes with how you sift through that data, how you have the right talent to sift through that data, identify what the insights are. And then from a marketing perspective, I think going beyond the obvious, um, and creating that fresh perspective based on the insights is what leads to success, and that's how we've seen success within the organization. Interesting, Dara. Have you had to, you know, learn anything new that you didn't know prior to, you know, you know, entering this world over the last two to three years? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm always learning new things, and I think the key when I think about, I think when I think about skills, I want to go a little bit deeper, mm -hmm. and I think curiosity is critical because things are constantly changing. And having that curiosity about what's next, what's out there, what's on the horizon, and being able to um, start to learn those things before it becomes like the flavor du jour, um, I found has been very helpful for me and for my team. So having curiosity and, pro and, and problem solving, because I find that sometimes you take someone who is doing one thing, but because they're curious, they on their own are like, hey, I want to take this general assembly course, or I found this thing at Berkeley or Stanford. And they start to build new skill sets that allow them to evolve and get there before the world yeah. gets there. So nobody's like shadowing their engineer <laughs> if that's not happening? No, not yet. no. I think okay. I think in our organization where we've naturally gravitated just based on the talent we've got is we call it the trifecta. Uh, we've got the marketing team, we've got the analytics team, and the technology team all working together to build an experience. And everyone is not just curious, but also really passionate about what they do. Um, and in fact, one of the mantras we have is if you fail, you fail fast, right? You learn from that and you continue to iterate. And that has really uh, helped us succeed, and we continue to re refine things. We have about two, 300 experiments running at any given day, mm. right? Because we've got this sort of model in between analytics, technology, and the marketing team. I, I want to talk about accountability, and I want to come back to that comment because I'm curious about how, you know, in this world of the CMO being held more accountable for driving real results, mm -hmm. you, you're also experimenting. Yes. Um, but uh, first, Ty, just. Talk, talk us through, like, you know, in this world in which marketers are held accountable, you've, you've you know, got to prove that every single dollar is working, right? You've got to prove that that ad that you're buying on some major TV event is going to actually drive people into the store, drive people, you know, or convert your, your customers. I mean, how has that changed the nature of your role? Does that, does this mean that your, you know, the tenure of the CMO in you know, decreases even more, you know, <laughs> we going, we're going to go from, you know, 44 months to like 30 months. Yeah, I think uh, as the evolution of these businesses, and you think of like Dollar Shave Club or Casper as these direct to consumer kind of places pop up, I think the ability, the CMOs that will be successful are the ones that can use all the data, take all the data and draw a solid line or linkage or correlation or causality to revenue. So one of the key skills then is really partnering with the CFO mm -hmm. and thinking about your marketing budget like uh, basically like a hedge fund mm -hmm. yep. and thinking about that you have um, you know different parts, different investment strategies. And I think it's up for you and the CFO to align on what your strategy is. Is it growth? Is it growth and profitability, et cetera? One thing that's um, 
we've been reasonably successful at is educating um, our senior management about the need for marketing R&D. Mm -hmm. You know, I think R&D is a very uh, understood principle within most uh, product organizations that is that you know you have an R&D pipeline. So I think what uh, the, the, the way that we've been successful at, at trying to say that not everything works is saying, hey, we're gonna put anywhere from five to 20% of our dollars in R&D. Mm -hmm. Here are the experiments we plan to run. And we have different categories of experiments. There's a set that's not that risky where we say two out of three of these will work. And then there's some more risky ones that probably have more upside that like one out of three. Oh, so just well. talking about it in terms of R&D and kind of keeping a scorecard of what works and, what, and being very transparent about that, I think breeds trust. So, so you're spending more time with your CFO. Yes. Um, are you, does this mean longer hours? Does this mean, you know, more pressure? <laughs> you know, how, how does this change? Your CMOs are already under tremendous, a tremendous amount of pressure. I mean, what does this, how does this change, you know? The, your work-life balance, how does this change the nature of the actual job itself? I think you have to be more strategic in the way you think about approaching problems, and I think you have to communicate um, more readily with, with your CEO and other senior leadership in the organization uh, to really get at the heart of what the <laughs> KPIs are, you know, for a particular um, initiative. Because um, your analogy um, was good, because there are so many different KPIs today in terms of what we're trying to do, but, and digital's been a big reason for that because you know it's added so many layers of, of insight. And so, what do you want to know? What do you want to learn? And, so, and sometimes, you know, I find myself going back saying, "Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You said this is what you wanted to understand, or this is what you wanted to do, or this was the objective. Now you're talking about this. Let's get back to to understanding, defining what it was that we were actually talking about." And I think you have to do that because. There's so much, there's so much um, to learn today, to understand and digest, that you have to be really clear on what the specific objectives that they are of each case or each, each project or program. Are you, um, are you also, you know, needing to educate your CFO? Like, how, how do you, you know, when, when you're setting aside budget for experimentation, um, because you know that the bulk of your budget is gonna, you're, you're, it's it's going to have to prove, you know, it's gonna have to be a performance, you know, marketing budget, right? I mean, how do you how do you convince your CFO that you still need to experiment? So I mean, I don't think there is any uh, CFO or CEO who's not gonna want business growth, right? <laughs> At the end of the day, um, I think in financial services and financial planning, um, as I say, it's it's uh, you know it's a business that is run through eight thousand advisors, and so the average length of sales is much longer than buying a red sweater from Macy's. Um, having said that, I think we've got a really good attribution model and a really good way of analyzing end to end uh, from the time that somebody has met with an advisor to the sale. That's one thing. But I think there is a large amount of education and there is also, you can get interim sort of success metrics coming through your experiments that sort of predict where you're gonna go. And we've started using a lot of that sort of predictive modeling within our experiments to figure out whether we're on the right track or not. And that has actually added um, a lot more rigor um, and, and, and comfort within budgets yeah. and approvals of budgets as we go about um, digital marketing. So are you hiring more engineers? How does this change the nature of your team, the people who work for you and report to you? I, I wanna just uh, talk something you said about the hours. I think uh, I have a quote that I really like, which is, if you set up goals, you're bound to fail, you have to set up systems. And so when, yeah. if you have 300 experience running a day, a day, you have to create systems, and you have to think about almost building a, a machine. Yeah. And so I, I think that is a way that the job, to, to your point, successful CMOs, they have to think about an end-to-end -end system, and it can't be one-off uh, 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 experiments as, as to be successful. I, I completely agree with that. I'm, it's always like, what's repeatable and scalable, yes. right? How is it repeatable and scalable? Because that's the only way, especially if you're in a global company, or that's the only way you can really scale. And so I think being organized about it, and I love what you said, because oh, that's exactly how I think about it too. It's like a portfolio. You have a portfolio of high growth ideas. And not every idea is gonna be as risky, right? The risk profile is different, but what are those portion 
um, of the idea that the innovation mm -hmm. piece, right? The R&D, the innovation part of marketing, the ones that will help us, maybe they're not generating the revenue streams today, but they will seed and secure future revenue streams. And thinking about that is important. And to answer your question of how do we think about skills, I think, you know, it, you, you still, I still think there is a role for the brand marketer, for the storyteller, for the creatives, right? So when I think about my org, I think about that, then I think about mm -hmm. go-to-market, mm -hmm. which includes our performance marketers, our data science team, um, our operations unit. And then we've got the product guys, right? The technical folks who have a deep understanding uh, of the technology of what we're offering and can help to bring that up. And then at the other side, I think it's almost like, I call them like our producers, yeah. our cross-functional producers that keep marketing, not in a silo, but connected to the other departments. So to IT, to finance, to product, et cetera. Because I think that's how um, I've been able to sort of structure our organization that's repeatable and scalable and helps us really be successful. I think you mentioned something which is very important to know because I think we've been talking so much about data and technology. I personally believe marketing is still an art and a science yes. both. Um, <clears throat> uh, the way we operate the marketing function, um, and that's the reason why I'm so excited about being a CMO right now because I can use both sides of my brain, right? The creative side and the analytical side. Um, I think there is data and there is technology that helps drive insights, but then there is the creative aspects that really brings, the storytelling aspects of it that really brings the vision to life. Mm. And I don't think that's ever gonna go, and that's where we've seen most success, especially when it comes to emotional storytelling. Um, but that it's both an art and a science. It, and I knew that you would say that, you know, that you need both. And I was going to ask, you know, obviously right now, like, science is sort of winning out in this mm -hmm. historic battle between art and science mm -hmm. um, because you're using data, you know, in new ways and, mm -hmm. and, you know, to such degrees. But, you know, are we going to start to see that, you know, balance sort of shift? I, are I don't, we gonna I see don't art know if it's necessarily winning out, but what's happening, I think, is that, that the science is being used to inform mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. creative the art. Mm -hmm. But pure art, is that, is there going to be a return to pure art? Pure creative, I have, I'm a creative director, I have proven that these ad campaigns, you know, from like the 90s, you know, sell products and people love them and they, you know, these big ideas, I mean, is that, is that coming back? Is that ever well, what, what, what data lets us do is be very, very targeted with those <laughs> messages and it allows us to, and that doesn't mean we can't, can't be really creative in our messaging, but it, it allows us to be much more focused and, and micro-target our messages to specific consumers or specific consumer groups, or <coughs> tribes. And I think that's that's the opportunity. So if we can then match the creativity with that that uh, ability to be much more targeted with our messaging and our storytelling, then I think that's an opportunity where the art and science really does take to the next so, so let me give you an example of what we mean by, because you talked about campaigns and the art of a campaign, right? So I can give you my own example. I came in about 14, 15 months ago, so I think I may have been in that average tenure of a CMO, Alex. Um, um, and, You're you know, still here. I'm still here. <laughs> um, and uh, I was asked to come up with a new campaign or go with the existing one. We had about 90 days or 120 days to come up with a new campaign. Um, so what we did was we did a lot of qualitative, quantitative research, and by the way, with a fairly new team, um, research to come up with what the insights were, right? You come up with the insights, you really look at, okay, what's the fresh perspective you add to it? You get the category. In our case, for financial planning, where we're competing with, um, you know, some of the major players such as a Mass Mutual or a Fidelity or a Merrill Lynch, everyone's talking about the future, everyone's talking about retirement. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to come up with an idea and an insight which was consistent where consumers feel that it's not about just the future, it's also about the present. So the campaign idea came out to be Spend Your Life Living, which is about the now and the tomorrow, which was fresh. But how we brought that to life was through really, really creating different stories around life stages, right? So we had a child who was going abroad and the, every, every parent feels like education is an important aspect. We had, um, uh, you know, a middle uh, middle aged family that had kids who's who who want to basically go to their friend's house and don't want to be at home, or they're constantly on devices. So relatable stories and a campaign that is pretty different from where everybody's talking about the future. We're talking about the now. Yeah. And so and all that and that that's a really good example of how you can do both. Right. Um, 
it'll be interesting to see what happens if, if, if there are any CMOs who who say I'm you know screw this data you know well I would well, I would definitely wouldn't say screw this data but I do think that there is still a because obviously we need that we need to perform and drive results I do think there is a space for the artist yeah. so to answer your question there is the art. You know, I was talking to a friend who's an editor, and she was like, I'm the editor because my judgment is superior. And I said, you know what, you are right. And when I think about the creatives on the team, yes. the reason they're the creative director is because their taste and their, their judgment is a little bit superior. And let me tell you, there have been campaigns, big dollar campaigns, where we have all done all the testing, and we've done all the data, and the data told us this would work. But I said to my creative director, what does your gut tell you? Yeah. And he's like, here's what I think will work. Yeah. And we launched this, and all the data said this would work, and it doesn't work. Right. But guess what? We had plan B. And so we switch it up, and we go to plan B, and that is brilliant. Yeah, that's that's what people connect with. Yeah. And it was like, you know what? But that doesn't make any sense. Well, the world doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, there is a lot we can learn from art and science. So I, I, I'm a strong believer that but, the art and, and back to your get back to your point. Um, you know, and, and that's that's good because data is very important today, and it does it, you know provide insights to to the creative messaging. But at the end of the day, sometimes you know it is a sensibility, it is an eye, and sometimes you just kind of know if it yeah. works or if it doesn't, and there's still because because we're communicating truth to consumers, and sometimes it still requires that gut check. Right, which is uh, and that makes one, more, one more point, which is uh, so I can tell you the example. I'm not I don't work there, but Nike's recent ad with Colin Ka Kaepernick. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can tell you that was not a data informed ad. <laughs> <laughs> that was pure creativity, yeah. and I think it's probably one of the best ROI yeah. ads in the history so, of ads yeah. as far as their sales impact on their stock price. So. I think they're always, marketing is always about storytelling, stories, yeah. and I think there's, that's a part of it. So we, I really wish we had like another two hours. I want to, <laughs> let's um, quickly talk about um, the blurring lines internally. <laughs> you are working with these tech companies, you're working with these data vendors, um, you're probably teaming up in a lot of ways with your chief technology officer. Um, people who work on, you know, in the engineering teams in ways that you hadn't in the past. Um, how is that changing the internal dynamics? And, you know, are you winning tech budgets when you're going and, you know, purchasing products from Adobe and Salesforce? Those perhaps were budgets, you know, overseen by the CTO in the past. Um, how is that? How is that shaking out? So again, um, in, 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 from a marketing perspective, our job is to build out experiences. And so there is a clear decision maker in terms of who defines that experience, and that's the marketing team. And so we work in partnership with our technology partners and our analytics partners. In fact, we had one of my directors very recently decided to switch vendors around uh, an ESP. She's the one who made the decision and then spoke to the technology people. And of course, we've got great partners. I mean, we basically work together in an open environment 24-7. So, so uh, but she was the decision maker because she thought that was the right thing by the customer. Yeah. So that's how we have been, um, how, I wouldn't say winning budgets, but sort of that's how we come to decisions. How, is, how are these new relationships impacting the reputation of the CMO, the, you know, the role in reputation, how the CMO is perceived internally and externally, is, you know, the CMO, perhaps the CMO is gaining um, steam internally because you are, you know, better informed and you are now working closely with those big tech companies and you do understand how the business works, how e-commerce works, you have to, but, you know, when it comes to the consultancy who has a relationship with the CEO and is trying to upsell marketing services, um, then the CEO comes back and says, do this, right? Right. Um, not to go off on a tangent, but I'm just <laughs> curious about the changing, you know, reputation of the CMO. Does anyone have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that's why, uh, I think the modern CMO has to embrace accountability. And what embracing accountability means is, I think, once again, embracing own, owning revenue. And if you look at most um, companies, if you own revenue, then you become a client versus a, uh, so, so I think that, you know, by embracing accountability, I think that, um, you know, and having a peer relationship where you side by side with your CTO, where you say, you know what, 
I don't know if we should have a Salesforce or Adobe, but I know what my requirements are, and you have to help me evaluate the technology. I'm partnering with them that way, and I, you know, writing checks to them to, to, to buy it. Uh, because I think the marketer now, if you're owning revenue, there are three places you can spend your money. You can spend it on people, you can spend it on technology, and like, uh, or you can spend it on you know, working the media dollars. And so I think too often, I think CMOs think more about the media allocation of like digital or TV. But you also have to think about is the return on investment of the MarTech stack, mm -hmm. what's that basically, and, and am I willing to board, you know, a significant portion because it's a multiplier. We're seeing all these like new titles like Chief Commercial Officer, not that they're brand new, but just, you know, more people with marketing backgrounds taking on these new kinds of titles. And I'm wondering like, what that says about the reputation of the word CMO, sort of like how a lot of new agencies launching aren't calling themselves agencies, right? They're like, I'm a consultancy. You know, agency is almost a dirty word in this, you know, in this landscape. I'm wondering if the same thing is happening to the CMO. I think the, the importance of the CMO has, has grown tremendously. Um, and I see myself in the company because of the fact that there is a high amount of importance given to what the customer and what the customer says and how the customer matters. So it all starts with that, and we're the closest to the customer, right? So I see myself as a change agent within the company, uh, pushing the boundaries in terms of making sure we come up with unique ideas from a customer perspective. And I jokingly say I see myself as the chief igniter, right? <laughs> coming up with new ideas and standing up for what you believe, and even if it is uh, an opposing view. But I've been fortunate enough to have a CEO who's basically empowered me to do that and peers who've allowed me to do that. Yeah, I think that the other thing I would say is I think for so long it was like, you know, the people that became the CEO, it was like the CFO becomes the CEO. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of the way the world worked. I think increasingly people are looking at the marketers and saying they really understand the customer. Yep. And guess what? They understand technology. And guess what? They kind of understand finance because they're willing to take PL responsibility. So if anything, I actually think the CMO is having a higher profile yep. because people are starting to take notice of the fact that we're delivering more. Is is it awkward in the elevator with the CTO? Like are you <laughs> is there like competitive awkwardness? Well I think the way the way I, I think about it and, and I, I, I've actually happened to love the CTO and the CFO. And I think the way it's like it's not me versus you, it's us versus the problem. Right? It is us in this battle, in this war for our customers. So thinking about that and just being strategic. Like for example, the person who leads technology on my team, I encourage him to go and sit in the CTO staff meetings and ask, and the CTO likes that because it feels less like we're just coming out of left field, throwing things here and there, but it feels more integrated. So looking for how you can take your team and not just have marketing being this silo, but as we're stretching and starting to interact with other organizations, how can you make sure that your team has regular operating rhythms with these other departments, yeah. whether it's finance or I think it's the inclusiveness, goal. right? Yeah. So when I started, my first best friend was my CTO. Right, just because I tend to gravitate towards more technology sort of focused uh, uh, experts, um, and and including my CTO in our leadership meeting, including my technology team, my analytics team. I call it my team. If you if you notice that, because we all work together. If you start the relationship that way, it just gets easier yeah. over time. It comes so, back to what we said earlier t at the very beginning, which is that sorry, is that the the CMO has to now. Uh, Bridge trust, you know, all the business units in many ways, and inform the the the, uh, the whole company uh, on the vision yeah. and the spirit of, of what the uh, the drive of the company is. I I'm because we don't have a lot of time left. I really want to get to this idea of like marketers needing to think about what consumers want and what consumers want. We've seen plenty of studies. What millennials want, what what younger consumers want is companies to stand for something. Um, purpose marketing, companies to take, you know, a controversial stance. Um, but in doing so, you're risking isolating your customer base, right? Or at least one of your customer bases. So how how do you deal with that as the CMO? You know, this is a two-part question. And then also, how do you separate your own personal beliefs from your brand's personal beliefs? Mm -hmm. Ty, let's start Yeah, with. so uh, I'm lucky enough to work at uh, Norton and LifeLock, which is actually our job is to protect people from cyber criminals. So one of the things, I've been here about 18 months, and I actually think that's such a noble purpose that I think the more we talk about that internally with employees, 
to your point, the better employees we attract. And I actually think the more we tell our, our customers the truth, or our prospects the truth, the more we'll sell. So I think having a purpose, we call ourselves protectors of the digital universe, and <laughs> kind of igniting that within and, and to our base is actually, I think, one of the most strategic and important things we can do as a marketing mm -hmm. function. Aditi, do you, do you find that you're, you know, as you think about these things, you're also thinking about like, well, I'm, you know, like, I'm also going to take on more risk. Like, I've not done that in my past, jo you know, jobs, but now we, like, I and we and my team, we have mm -hmm. to take on a, a risk. Yep. You know, how do you think about that? Absolutely. So, so uh, coming back to purpose driven, um, I've historically felt much at ease at companies that are more mission driven, so to speak. Um, and so at a certain point of time, you tend to choose companies that are more mission driven with financial, with, with Northwest Mutual, you know, it's a very mission driven company about delivering financial security to all Americans, which for me, money is such a basic ingredient of your day to day existence. But then once you get to a position of influence, uh, what you start to do is, at the, and of course at the right time, you start to figure out how you can influence the organization. So one of the things that I noticed when I took the role is, when you look at large financial planning companies, there's no company out there, at least I believe, that is really speaking to women. Um, I happen to be a woman, a mom, and I jokingly say we're half the universe, or a little bit more than half the universe. Um, and so what did we do? We actually came up with a all women campaign for the first time, end to end from commercials to content to digital marketing. So that's how I have sort of been able to marry my personal beliefs of what matters to me with the company. The one thing I'll say is I think purpose and cause are very different, right? And I think that um, the purpose of a company, the why a company exists, the mission that a company has is really critical. And in this age of the conscious consumer, where brand and culture are the same and reflect the same things, I think it's really important that companies continue to not just articulate their purpose, but we would be willing to take a stand for that purpose. I think the Nike example, right, is, it, is a big example of what that looks like actualized. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, increasingly, companies need to figure out how, where do I want to choose to take a stand? Because you can't take a stand on everything. Right. So, and, and and not be kind of necessarily shaken by cause, but necessarily look at your purpose and say, when I look at our purpose, what are the things that matter to us? Let's take a stand on those things. And the other things that don't matter, maybe we don't choose to take a stand there. Like it makes sense. Nike working with athletes, right? I mean, that is right in their arena. They're not necessarily, you know, we've seen examples of when that goes awry when it's not authentic and there's no truth, and it's like, well. Why are you talking about right. that? So Stephen, given that, what does the future CMO look like personality-wise, right? Do you, is the future CMO going to be like somebody who's like a poker player? Like someone who like, you know, is comfortable with like taking risks? Someone who, who you know, can read a room? Like what, you know? What? I, I think it's just the opposite. I think it's someone who has empathy. I think it's someone who has to understand the needs and the wants and the desires of the customer. Um, for us, it's the community. We, we serve communities. Um, and I think that's that's really what, what you need to, to find, is someone who can be empathetic to, to the interests. Okay, so um, because we only have five minutes left and I have like a thousand more questions, um, I, I'm just gonna ask a two-parter. Um, I'm gonna ask everyone to um, share what, you know, given all these changes and all the things that we talked about, like, what are you freaked out about? Like, what are, like, what is your biggest challenge right now? Like, what are you worried about and, and needing to change? And what, in, you know, however many years, look at your crystal ball, like, if, if you're not, your title is not Chief Marketing Officer, what will it be? Sorry. Me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, LifeLock uh, got acquired by Symantec 18 months ago. So Symantec is a very product and sales driven Silicon Valley enterprise software company. So my biggest challenge right now is educating a product and sales driven organization how consumer driven customer acquisition and marketing works and how, you know, how uh, we, they should invest in this channel versus channels they're more comfortable with. So. That's a little different than, you know, you're at a smaller company, I think you're focused on doing the work. I think here the, the, the focus is on educating um, both the executive suite and, and the board 
uh, about how investment works in this channel. What was the second question? Um, if not chief marketing officer in five, 10, yeah. years. I, I think that, uh, I mean, hit it. Well, I think the CMO, because of the, um, the, the skills it'll take are actually evolving towards more general managers. I mean, if you look, like I said, I have a p and I have a budget that I have discretion over how I spend as long as I drive the results. So I think uh, for CMOs who are embracing accountability, I think it'll be kind of the new GM. Um, and it's a path to, to, to general management. So line versus staff. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. My turn. Okay, well, um, what keeps me up and what worries me the most is the rate of change. Um, and, you know, I think 5G is gonna change our worlds again, all of us, everybody, but we don't even know how yet. And that's that's what, I guess, concerns me the most. We don't even know what we don't know as far as what the future might bring because ch technology and change is happening so fast. So so staying ahead of that curve, staying, staying focused on where the change is taking us and being nimble, uh, being an organization that can be nimble and change with, with, with the new information is really important. So, you know, maybe the new title is Chief Understanding <laughs> okay. Um, I think what keeps me up at night um, is talent and making sure that we are continuously bringing in talent, um, developing talent for the pace of change that's happening. Um, I think to me that is something which is, even now, it's so competitive to, to get talent and keep talent. So I think that's the piece that I'm, I'm, I'm most focused on. Um, in terms of the role of the CMO, I think I may have briefly mentioned this, I think its, it's span of, uh, of influences moved more to a GM kind of role. Uh, chief customer officer, chief transformation officer, um, I think that's sort of where the, the breadth of the role is going. I would say the thing that worries me most is that we actually forget the importance of balance. So I'm tr constantly trying to strive for balance. Um, in my personal life, in my work life, in my team, in how we're approaching art and science. So I think that kind of constant strive for balance and not to be complacent and stay where we are, but how do we continue to move forward? Balance and still movement. So what's forward. like the most different thing about your job in 10 years? Like what are you doing that in 10 years that you're not doing now? I think in 10 years, um, we are interacting with our customers in a very different way because blockchain has disrupted kind of the middleman, mm -hmm. Facebook and Google. But you as a CMO. And I think me as a CMO, it's like really understanding how the hell do we interact with our customers? Do we charge them for their data? What does that look like? And figuring out that interaction, that new interaction that I think will exist. Okay, um, we've got 44 seconds left. So I, I think, um, I'm not, I think we're, we're done. <laughs> I'm going to get yelled out if I try to go through some of these um, Q&A questions. Um, but thank you all so much for your honest uh, responses, and thank you all for being here. Thank you.